Good morning. Good morning for those who are watching online. How many of you guys have ever gotten into a fight? Be honest, you're in church. How many of you sit next to the person you lost that fight to? Every husband should raise their hand right now. You know you've lost that verbal fight. We live in a world where we often have to fight, to wrestle, to struggle. We fight to pay our bills. We fight autocorrect. There are times where I feel like I need to be rebaptized when I'm using autocorrect. We fight to overcome our lemon loaf addiction. Will Farrell once said, Before you marry a person, you should first make them use a computer with slow internet service to see who they really are. Can I get an amen? Or an oh my? While Forrest Gump said that life is like a box of chocolates... Life often feels more like an ongoing episode of WWF. In fact, the Apostle Paul said at the end of his life, I have fought the fight, I have kept the faith. In other words, if he was going to sum up his relationship with God, he says, I have fought the fight. Do you know who the most famous wrestler of all time is? Throw out some wrestling names. Go ahead. Hulk Hogan. Who else? The Rock. Who else? Cassius, who? <laughs> Junkyard Dog, Jesse Ventura. It's none of the above. The most famous and influential wrestler, the one who has been painted the most, is Jacob. Jacob, how is that for a wrestling name? Yeah, set you up, but it's true. He has had more pictures painted about him than any other wrestler and more written about him than any other wrestler. Here's the story as it appears in Genesis. Genesis chapter 32, verse 24 through 28. And you're like, Pastor Dan, I thought we were in Acts chapter 3. We will be. Genesis chapter 32, verse 24 through 28. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, What is your name, Jacob? He said. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Everyone say Israel. Because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. If you've ever wondered where the name Israel comes from, it comes from this experience, this very moment. The word Israel means to wrestle with God. To wrestle with God. At the heart of God's redemptive plan is this idea of wrestling. Remember Paul says, I have fought the faith. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the faith. Genesis has some weird stuff in it, like a talking snake. That should have been the first clue to Adam and Eve not to listen. If my dog starts talking to me, I am not going to eat anything that it suggests. Just being honest, I don't care if it's saying, look at that tree, it's going to make you wise. Shut up, dog. (laughs) Get behind me, Satan. But one of the weirdest stories for me is Jacob wrestling with an angel. It's the only time we see something like this in Scripture. And it happens in the middle of the night. Have you ever had trouble sleeping? Anyone have like insomnia? We got any fellow insomniacs? All right. You know, whether it was because you had too much caffeine before bed or you were watching a scary movie or there was guilt because you forgot to give Sunday morning. I'm just throwing that out there because there's still time. I mean, you could still go to push pay and relieve that guilt so you can sleep well tonight. I'm just looking out for your best interest. Jacob is having trouble sleeping, and he's planning to meet with his brother Esau, who had threatened to kill him the last time they spoke because Jacob stole his birthright. And it wasn't like an idle threat when you say to like your brother or sister, I'm going to kill you, but you're not actually going to commit homicide. This was one of those things where Esau was like, no, I'm going to really kill you. Jacob's brother Esau hates his guts. In fact, His twin spots him coming in Jacob's direction, and Esau's bringing 400 men along with him. Does that look like a family reunion to you? No, it looks like he's getting ready for war. He's bringing 400 men with him. So Jacob decides to spend some time in prayer. 
He's like, I ain't got 911, so I'm going to go talk to God about these 400 people. So he crosses this river called the Jabbok. Sounds like something from Star Wars. Which is 23 miles north of the Dead Sea. It flows through deep canyons and runs into the Jordan. And it's really choppy waters. Think of like whitewater rafting. Here's a picture. Uh, this is calm here. But in reality, it often has very choppy. So... This means that he's pretty desperate to get along with God if he's willing to cross this river in the middle of the night to be by himself. He is desperate to get alone with God. While he's praying, some stranger jumps him. Imagine if all of a sudden you're like, you know what, I'm going to go pray after church because I feel convicted about not giving this morning. So I'm going to go and I'm going to pray about it. And all of a sudden someone jumps you. That's what's going on. He's like, I'm praying. And all of a sudden he gets jumped. And it becomes this all night wrestling match. There's full-on full Nelsons, eye gouging, hair pulling, sweat, begging for a timeout, but neither will quit. It's not until morning that Jacob realizes that he's been wrestling with God. He's been wrestling with God. The prophet Hosea puts it like this. Hosea chapter 12, verse 4. He struggled with an angel or representative of God and overcame him. He wept and begged for his favor. I love the statement that Jacob makes in Genesis chapter 32, verse 26. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jacob was willing to fight for God's best. Jacob was willing to fight for God's best. We all have to choose to struggle or subtle. I believe that this story takes place because God wanted Israel to know that if they wanted his best, it was going to be a wrestling match. They would have to fight themselves. They would have to fight other people. That those promises were not going to just happen automatically. They would have to fight for God's best. Amen? But too often we have uphill hopes with downhill habits, in the words of John Maxwell. We want the results of Jesus without the routine of Jesus. We need more Jacobs who are willing to wrestle and say, I will not let you go until you bless me. I will not let you go until you bless me. But in this wrestling, Jacob is bruised and blessed. And that's the key phrase this morning. He is bruised and blessed. He will walk away from this wrestling match with a limp, and a cane because his hip has been wrenched. So he will be blessed, but he will also be bruised. So on one hand, he's richly blessed. And from now on, anytime the Israelites refer to God, they refer to him as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's richly blessed. But it also comes at the cost of a limp. Forever now he will have a limp and a cane because of this wrestling match. Our relationship with God can be described as one of wrestling as well. A fight between faith and doubt, hope and despair, love and hate, blessings and bruisings. Last Sunday, I was hiding in my office because my wife and middle son were both sick. I wasn't hiding from them. I was hiding for you. I wasn't sick, but I knew there was a chance I might be carrying what they had, and so I didn't want to be responsible for the zombie apocalypse. You're welcome. I was in the back hiding, resting, three minutes before service was supposed to, so worship's already going on, so three minutes before I'm supposed to preach, I'm back there, I'm resting. My heart rate is a cool Zen 60. I looked down and I thought to myself, this is going to be a great day. This is going to be so good. Praise God, hallelujah. <laughs> then all of a sudden, I didn't feel good. And I looked down at what was 60, and it was 136 and going higher. And I rolled my eyes at God. A big roll my eyes at God. Enough that it went even higher. I was like, God, I was just thanking you for the 60. What's going on? Now, I have two minutes before I have to come up here. So I take one of my emergency pills. I have an emergency pill for such situations. So I take an emergency pill. And it's great for bringing the heart rate down, but it also brings the blood pressure down. How many of you guys have ever had low blood pressure? It makes you feel really what? Awesome. Awesome. 
like you had Taco Bell. Sick to your stomach, dizzy, feeling out of it. I mean, Taco Bell, woo! So, after I get done preaching, I get several text messages of, Pastor Dan, that was the best sermon you've had all year. So great. Blessings and bruisings. You never know what someone is going through. Jacob is richly blessed, but he is also permanently bruised. There is this tension between blessing and bruising, and that leads us to Acts chapter 3, which is where I want to spend this morning. I saw the following quote this past week. Cupcakes are muffins that believed in miracles. I love that because there are too many brain Christians and they need to become cupcakes this morning. Amen? I want to be a cupcake Christian. In Acts chapter 3, we will encounter the first miracle or healing in the early church. So first healing in the early church, Acts chapter 3, verse 1. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Jewish culture had three specific times of prayer that they would do every day, 9 a.m., 12 o'clock, and 3 p.m. So three different times they would go and they'd pray, and if they were near the temple, they would like to go to the temple for that time of prayer. This can be traced all the way back to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. And through that, they developed this tradition of praying three times a day. Is your prayer life more sporadic or systematic? Is prayer a priority? Is it a part of your daily routine? The early church participated in group prayer all the time. There are at least 14 different group prayers in the book of Acts. Remember, Jesus taught them to pray, Our Father who art in heaven. It is a group prayer. And so we see 14 different times where they get to pray, specifically in Acts chapter 2, which springs boards all the rest of the stuff that happens. No prayer, no power. No prayer, no power. Without Acts chapter 2 and that prayer, we don't see the miracle in Acts chapter 3. Amen? And so we see them going to the temple for prayer. Verse 2. Now a man who is lame, everyone say lame. Lame. That was lame. Everyone say lame. Lame. From birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When I was growing up, if we called a person lame, we meant that they were boring. Right? We meant that they were boring. And if they were really boring, we would say that they belonged to the Hall of Lame. And if they were old and boring, we would say that they were a lamasaurus. And yes, I understand that I sound lame. Lame here means someone who can't walk on their own. That's what lame means in this context. It's someone who can't walk on their own. Now, the reason why he's laying outside the temple is for two reasons. Number one, he's not allowed inside. There should be gasping right now. (gasps) He's not allowed in the temple. His being lame didn't just impact him physically, but also spiritually. He can't go to church. Leviticus chapter 21 verse 18 says, No man who has any defect may come near, speaking of the temple, no man who is blind or, say it with me, lame, disfigured, or deformed. Because of this rule, the man couldn't enter the temple, but had to lie at the entrance which would have been on the east side of the court of Gentiles. He had to live on the fringe of faith. The temple was made up of, you had the Holy of Holies, you had the Holy Place, you had the court of Israel, you had the court of women, you had the court of Gentiles, and then you had where this man would have been laying. So if the Holy of Holies was like the bedroom, this guy was on the couch. He is as far away from God's presence as possible. He has to stay on the fringe of faith. Now, while this was the Levitical law, the prophets predicted that a time would come where God would heal the lame. Isaiah chapter 35, verse 6. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout 
for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. When the lame man woke up that morning, he had no idea that Isaiah chapter 35 verse 6 was about to become a reality in his life. He thought he was going there to beg once again, to sit at the fringe of faith once again, but didn't realize he was about to be ushered into the presence of God and be healed and restored because of Jesus. What's interesting is that in Acts chapter 4, we will discover that this man was about 40 years old. In Acts chapter 4, we will be told that he was about 40 years old. Keep in mind, Jesus died at the age of 33, so this man was seven years older than Jesus. When Jesus went to the temple at the age of 12, this man would have been 19 and more than likely would have been on that porch. He had been there day after day after day looking for restoration, looking for healing. Every time Jesus would have went to celebrate Passover at the temple, Luke tells us that he went yearly, he would have passed by that man. That man would have been laying there. You see, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Just because you feel like Jesus has passed you up, just because you feel like you keep waiting and nothing's happening, doesn't mean that God has rejected you. Sometimes it's a matter of timing. He will make all things beautiful in its time. Amen? He went out to the outside of the temple for a second reason. Number two, This was the most strategic place to beg for money. Catch people when they're feeling generous. Think about Salvation Army sitting outside of Target at Christmas time. Or your kids when you get an IRS refund. Somehow they just know. It's like, were they like peeking at the mailbox? How do they know I got that extra money coming in? That's when people's hearts and wallets are most open. A lady wrote on Twitter this last week Someday, God willing, I will attend my children's wedding, refuse to eat what they serve, and demand butter noodles and nuggets. I love that idea. When you go to church, what are you looking for? When you come in on a Sunday morning, what are you looking for? The beggar went looking for money. Peter and John went looking for ministry. He came in looking for money, but they came in looking for ministry. You don't have to be a pastor to minister to people on Sunday mornings. You don't have to be clergy to minister to people on Sunday mornings. Think about Keith doing Donald Duck to all the kids as they come in on a Sunday morning. Everyone knows him as Donald. And all those kids are going to grow up thinking, he, that's Donald Duck. But he's ministering to people. Acts chapter 3, verse 3 through 5. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Notice the phrase, look at us. Look at us. Someone once pointed out the difference between a math introvert and a math extrovert is the following. The introvert stares at their shoes when they're talking to you. The extrovert stares at your shoes as they're talking to you. We struggle with eye contact in our culture. We struggle with eye contact in our culture. I watch people as they come in on Sunday mornings, and do you know what most people do as they sit down? Look at their cell phone. It used to be when people would come into church, they would greet one another, or maybe they'd spend a few moments in prayer, but everyone's looking at their cell phone. It's almost like a security blanket, like a nervous habit. We just pull out our cell phones just habitually. The miracle would never happen in the modern church because we wouldn't notice the lame man. We wouldn't see him. People are too focused and distracted by their phones. We need to work on a healthy level of eye contact in the church. And I want you to practice it. Look at the people around you for a moment. We need to practice a healthy level of eye contact. Now, I didn't say staring contest. And I didn't say be creepy. Some of you were like, I have been waiting for this moment because there's this girl that I'm interested in, and the pastor said, I got to look at you. 
that was not your moment. Don't be a creeper. Pretty sure it's in Leviticus. Thou shall not be creepy. But like Goldilocks, find the middle amounts. You know, the just right amount of eye contact. You have to see the moment to seize the moment. You have to see the moment to seize the moment. Jesus was great at this. Most of his miracles happened because he walked slowly through the crowd. Not because he was at a church just waiting for people to come to him. But because he walked slowly through the crowd and he noticed the people who were hurting and needed his attention. Acts chapter 3 verse 6. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have. But what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Pope Innocent II was hanging out with Thomas Aquinas one day, supposedly a true story. Well, thinking about Peter's statement, the Pope proudly said, the church can no longer say silver and gold, have I none? At that time, the church owned half of Europe. It was very wealthy, but the philosopher wisely responded, true, Holy Father, the church can no longer say silver and gold, I do not have. Unfortunately, it can no longer say like Peter, rise up and walk. We have become wealthy physically, but we have become poor spiritually. We have lost our sense of impact. Acts chapter 3, verse 7 through 10. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to do the Snoopy dance. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all of the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him because he'd been sitting out there day after day after day. It's the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had just happened. This is the first healing out of nine healings in the book of Acts. The first healing out of nine healings in the book of Acts. And you would think that this would have started a tent revival. Let's go empty the hospitals, bring them to Peter and John, and let's restore everybody, right? But instead, this moment leads to jail. We go from revival to prison time. Acts chapter 4, verse 2 through 3. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead, Never mind that the lame man's walking and leaping and dancing. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail. Everyone say jail. jail. Until the next day. The early church experienced blessings and bruisings. As we read through the book of Acts, we will go through series of miracles and persecution. There will be this constant tension of blessings and bruisings. And it shouldn't surprise us. Because Jesus experienced the same exact thing. Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Jesus is having a great day. I don't know if you've ever had someone brag on you. I think one of my favorite ministry moments is I was preaching one time, and this girl, Anna, got up, and she did a slow clap. I think it was 90% sarcastic, but it is still my favorite moment. <laughs> While on vacation, there was this talent show, and my kids both started bragging about me, and they started telling everyone that I was the greatest rapper that they knew and that I should join. Later, my son, they hadn't heard a lot of rap at that point. Later, my son said to me, I want to be just like you when I grow up. He no longer feels that way. But when he was I, eight years old, he was so much wiser and smarter. You know, I don't know why he outgrew that, but when he was eight, he was wise. God breaks 400 years of silence to brag on Jesus. We don't realize that when we watch this moment. God has been silent for 400 years, and he breaks that to brag on Jesus. This is my son. I love him. I'm pleased with him. 
It would be like a monk breaking a vow of silence to tell a girl how beautiful she is. It's like, dude, you've been on like a vow of silence for 40 years. And he's like, I know, but she's just gorgeous. I got to let her know. Most people will go through life wondering if God is pleased with them. But Jesus knows, matter of factly, because God shouts it from the heavens. So what do you expect to happen next? If you had never read this story before, what would you expect to happen next if God breaks 400 years of silence to say, I love this guy. I'm well pleased with him. He's amazing. He's awesome. Listen to him. Maybe a parade. Perhaps a party. Maybe a Disney song and dance. But that's not what happens. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. And in the original, there are no chapters and verses, so it goes right into it. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Or to be tested by the devil. I love you. I'm well pleased with you. Off you go! It's devil time! Heaven's jazz hands. Woo! Devil time! Jesus was led by God to go toe-to-toe with the most evil being in the universe, worse than Barney the purple dinosaur. Jesus is going from God's testimony to God's test. One of my favorite stories about tests is the following. There was a young student who was studying ornithology, study of birds. They're getting ready for their final exam. It was going to be worth 50% of the the test grade, so it was a big deal. They went in after studying all night, cramming, and they go in and they notice that up on the wall are 10 pictures of birds' legs, and that's it. And the professor tells them that in order to pass this, you're going to have to identify all 10 birds based on their legs. The person thinks to himself, this is ridiculous. I know everything there is to know about birds, but there's no way I can identify them based on their legs because they all look identical to me. So he takes the test, and he slams it down on the teacher's desk, and he says to him, this is a stupid test. There's no way anyone could guess what the birds are based on the legs, so I refuse to take the test. He says, well, it's 50% of your grade, so if you don't take it, you're going to fail. He's like, well, then I guess I'm going to fail. So he starts to storm off. The professor stops him because there's like 300 students in the room. He's like, all right, you're going to get an F, but what's your name? Pulls his pants leg up. He says, you tell me, buddy. You tell me. (laughs) It's my favorite test story of all time. What Jesus knew that we often forget is that a season of testing can lead to a season of blessing depending on how we respond. A season of testing can lead to a season of blessing depending on how we respond. It's only after Jesus passes the test of being in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights that his public ministry begins. But it doesn't begin until after the season of testing. He heals the sick, he frees the lost, he brings hope, but it all happens after the test. So what's the point of a test? Tests show us what we need to know and where we need to grow. A test shows you what you need to know and where you need to grow. A test will show you if you're ready for the next level. If you fail kindergarten, it would be cruel to put you in first grade because you're just going to fail first grade. So if you keep failing the test, it would be cruel of God to keep advancing you because you're not ready for it. You have to be ready for the next level. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. God told the Israelites, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you. When Jesus quotes Scripture three times during this desert time, he quotes from Deuteronomy 6 and chapter 8, which is where we get this verse here to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. Nothing reveals your heart like a crisis. Nothing will show you your theology like your world falling apart. Are you only committed to God when things are going well? Tests come in many disguises, like a traffic jam. Someone who still doesn't know how to use a turnabout. An unexpected or unwanted guest. A child throwing a temper tantrum in the middle of Walmart. Just because you're in a season of testing right now doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. 
This is my son in whom I love. In him I'm well pleased. Now you're going to go get tested. He is tested because God loves him. Just because Peter and John were in jail for helping a lame man didn't mean God didn't love them. How easy it would have been for them to be like, all right, God, if we heal people and it means we go to jail, I'm going to stop healing people. Problem solved. No healings, no jail time. We'll go back to fishing. It was a little, I never went to jail for fishing. It would be a whole lot easier. But Peter and John would never say that because they knew that ministry always comes with bruisings and blessings. Ministry always comes with bruisings and blessings. Turn to the person next to you and tell them your favorite season, like fall, spring, winter, summer. Tell them your favorite season. How many of you are sitting next to someone who said winter? Uh, Say, feel free to slide over because we're going to ask God to smite them. (laughs) Nobody should say winter. I love Christmas, but I could do it without winter. Someone said the reason why we call this month May is because it may rain, it may snow, maybe 70, maybe 20. How many of you said summer? All right, all right, about maybe 60%. I know technically it's not summer until June 21st, but it's starting to feel like summer. Now, I love that it's starting to get warmer. I can go out with shorts. I don't because no one needs to see these legs, but I could if I wanted to go out. And... I could practically hear the song, summer, summer, summertime. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but the sad reality is that as the temperature goes up outside, the spiritual temperature goes down inside. Has anyone ever noticed that? It's called summer bummer. <laughs> Every pastor gets depressed just around summer because they know it's about to happen. Like there's all this momentum around Easter time where everyone's like, I love church. And then all of a sudden it's like sunny outside and everyone's like, I kind of like church. People slack off in devotions, giving, volunteering. Now, not you guys. I'm speaking about the other churches, which I won't name, but I'll point While you can take a vacation from work, you can never take a vacation from serving. For example, on my 15-year wedding anniversary, me and my wife had big plans. But we lost our babysitter last minute. We ended up with three kids at the Dream Park for our anniversary. My wife is so lucky. It was so romantic. And while we were there, both sulking as our kids were having a blast... I noticed a kid climb too high and get stuck. And he kept crying out, Grandma, Grandma, but she was busy with scratch-offs and did not hear him. (laughs) And I thought to myself, this is my day off. My plans are already ruined. You shouldn't have climbed that high, buddy, if you can't get back down. I mean, survival of the fittest. (laughs) Maybe this is nature's way of telling you. But I climbed up there and I rescued him. And I thought to myself, as I did it, I may have just saved the future president of the United States. (laughs) Five minutes later, he was up there stuck again. May still be the future president of the United States. Matthew 23, verse 11 through 12. The greatest among you will be your servant, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. In a world where people believe that the greater you are, the more people serve you, Jesus turned it around and said, the greater you are, the more people you'll serve. That it's not something that you'll just volunteer to do. It's something that you will be. As Pastor Jason was trying to tell us, is that you will keep your head on a swivel looking for opportunities to help those who are hurting because guess what? They're not just in here. They are everywhere you go. There are opportunities to serve. You see the... Church isn't about going to a service. It's about being empowered for service. It's about being empowered for service. It's about living a life of service. For so many people, there's a reluctance to serve because you've been hurt. You've been bruised. You've been burnt out. 
I can't tell you how many people have sat in these chairs and they've said to me, Pastor Dan, the last church I was at hurt me. I used to do all these things and I just, I can't do it anymore because I've been hurt. And I get it. We need to go through a time of healing, a time of restoration, but guess what? This side of eternity, you will continually be hurt because the world is broken. It's, this is not heaven. We're not there yet. There will be hurt, but you have to learn to serve in spite of the pain. But we forget. We forget that just like Jesus and Jacob and Peter and John, that there will always be blessings and bruisings. But it's easy to downshift. It can be as simple as refusing to eat what the rest of the family's having for dinner. Anybody have a kid like that? We're not changing the toilet paper the right way. I feel like we need to do a class. Or touching the decorative towels. Those are not for you to wipe your hands on. They are decorative towels. Right now, my wife is saying amen, and I can hear it through the live stream right now. She's at home, and I can hear, amen! I was watching this movie called The Secret Life of Pets with my kids. And then there's this scene where the, this dog gets captured by all these nasty cats, and they drag him up to the top of the roof, and they put him on a bungee, and they, and they drop him. And my youngest looks back at me and says, I want to do that to you, Dad. <laughs> I was like, you do not have the gift of serving, that is for sure. That's a pastor's kid right there. we got to cast the Colton out of the demon. And I said that correctly. <laughs> but when we are bruised, when we are facing a prison moment, we have to remind ourselves of why we serve. And I know I'm like uh, just a couple minutes late, and it's okay. I'll, I'll go fast. Genesis chapter 29, verse 20. The sunshine will still be waiting for you. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seem like only a few days to him because of his love for her. He serves for 14 years, but it feels like a couple of days because of his love for her. The why behind the what. Serving is easy when you love the reason why you're serving. Serving is easy when you love the reason why you're serving or you love the one for why you're serving. When there's an inspiration behind the perspiration, do you want to know whether a junior high boy is in love or not? They will shower voluntarily. That's how you know that they are in love. The serving was easy for Jacob because he was smitten. A few years ago, a young lady at the church, she, uh, she got kicked out of her house, and she had a baby, and my family decided to let her move in with us. And it wasn't an easy decision. My house is already really small, overcrowded. We have three growing boys, two busy parents, a 70-pound lap dog, and a partridge in a pear tree. But you walk in the front door and you're in the backyard. That's how small the house was. And all we had to offer was a couch bed in our basement, but that was more than she had. It was that or live on the street. So I talked to my family. We all agreed to do it, and it came at a sacrifice for my kids because their playroom was in the basement where that couch bed is at, which meant for a month they couldn't just go play with their toys whenever they wanted like they were used to because now there was someone else living there. But even harder, there was only one bathroom for all those people. Yes. Thank you, Lily. <laughs> Serving comes at a sacrifice. But it's worth it if you love the one for whom you're serving. Jesus paid it all for you. How can we do any less for him? That's the bottom line. Jesus paid it all. Therefore, he, oh, he deserves our very best. I'm going to end with this. We share our resources with others, and God in turn shares his resources with us because God has a way of serving the servants. That if you continue to pour out, God will continue to pour into you because he serves the servants. Peter and John will get out of jail, and they'll go on to heal more people. Don't let your bruising keep you from your blessing. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you so much for your presence. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your willingness to use us. God, we pray that we'd be a blessing in the lives of others. In your name, amen. Now, I know the worship team is going to lead us in one last song of worship, but I wanted, before we do that, I'm going to invite the floods to come up. So, Kyle, you'll have to snake your way around. So I know people are going to start wanting to migrate out of here. So before we get to worship, I want to just make an announcement here. You guys could just kind of stand here for everybody. And those who are online can see. Speaking of blessings and bruisings, next Sunday is the floods last Sunday here at the well. They are moving to Florida. And they are... Uh, Tamara will do the, the Mother's Day presentation, uh, but then they're leaving like right afterwards, and it's Mother's Day, so we knew we wouldn't really have the chance to pray with them, and then we also have some cupcakes and stuff for people who want to you know, say their, their goodbyes this week. Uh, but we got them a gift card. It's to a Wisconsin restaurant, though. <laughs> so they will have to come back if they want to use it. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's a gas card that, that can be used to help with your fuel. And there's a trillion things I would like to say. I've known these guys for a long time, and we've done a lot of ministry, a lot of time in the trenches. And I, to just be transparent, have had a really hard time with this. Um, so the way I'm going to put it is that I am... Sad for the well, but I'm glad for the kingdom because obedience leads to opportunity. And while it is a loss to us, it is a gain to the kingdom because God goes with you wherever you go, and he's going to use you wherever you go. And with that, we'd like to pray for you. Drum, Jason, where are you at? Uh, you're plugged in? Sorry, buddy. Jason's going to pray. Tony, could you come up and take Jason's place? I knight you. There you go. <laughs> then if everyone else could stand up, we'll pray for them, and then we'll go into worship. Father, I thank you so much for the floods. God, I thank you for blessing us, that we got to do life together, ministry together, that they are both friends and partners and God, I am so excited for them. God, I think about Abraham, where you called him out of Ur to go to the promised land. And I'm not saying Florida is the promised land, but sometimes we have to leave to receive. Sometimes we have to go to experience the blessings that you have for us. And God, I just pray that you would give them courage, that you would give them peace, that you would give them favor, and that they would know how much they are loved. And God, that we will continue to pray for them, support them, encourage them wherever they end up. In your name, amen.